On Frontline tonight, a story of football. But it is not played on the field, nor cheered from the stands. The action of this story takes place off the field. It's a story about bookies. It's a story about the outlaw line, football, illegal gambling, and the mafia. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is Frontline with Jessica Savage. As long as there have been professional sports, there's been gambling. But when you are talking about pro football gambling, you're talking about organized crime's major source of income, billions, which law enforcement agencies tell us are then used to fund other mob ventures, drugs and prostitution and racketeering. The NFL's only protection against mob influence is a rule prohibiting league members from associating with known gamblers or underworld figures. It is a rule enforced by an internal security department which reports to a commissioner hired by team owners. Is this enough to ensure fans a clean game? Ask yourself that question while you watch tonight's Frontline premiere broadcast. And one word of caution, there is one graphic sequence. is now America's favorite game. Football generates more illegal betting than all other sports combined. Every time a game is televised, the volume of betting goes up 600%. You are looking live at the Silverdome in Michigan. At last year's Super Bowl, Americans bet over five billion dollars. Sixteen, America's greatest sports spectacle. And twenty. The two teams with the best records in football. CBS Sports featured Jimmy the Greek Snyder. He was once convicted of illegal bookmaking, but this popular television tipster was granted a presidential pardon. I have some inside information that nowhere else you'll find. And a choice that may just boggle your mind. Take 14. <laughs> Super Bowl 16. In today's America, football betting recalls the days of prohibition. An illegal activity is widely tolerated by the public and even encouraged by some of the nation's more respectable institutions. He's thinking about it. Anderson is going to get in. We talked about this earlier. When he jogs, his radio goes with him. This is Lem Banker. He makes his living from football betting. The latest scores are ticker taped into his kitchen. And a satellite dish keeps Lem Banker tuned into games being played in the 49 other states where football gambling is illegal. The gilded jacuzzi and the waterproof radio a prized possessions he paid for with football winnings because football betting is legal in Las Vegas. Football betting is the fastest growing form of gambling in Las Vegas. The odds that govern football gambling originate here, in the legal casinos and sports books. Here, the ordinary public rub shoulders with the serious bettors, the agents, 
the runners, the beards, the wise guys. Frontline film during the NFL players' strike, when only college games were being played. But the point spread works in the same way. Harvard, two. State, five. In betting on the point spread, or line, you don't bet on which team will win or lose, but on the margin of victory. The point spread is a form of handicapping. As the opening line is posted, Florida is favored by 13. Florida may win, but if it's by anything less than 13, those who bet on Florida will lose their money. The amount of money bet on a game can shift the points up or down. So several of those who come here are paid by illegal bookies and heavy bettors outside Nevada to phone in the latest changes. But the odds are not set first in the sports books, but by the outlaw line, which is inextricably linked to organized crime. Frank Masturana, a convicted bookie. He's about as close to the outlaw line as you can get. Every Sunday afternoon before the weekend's games are over, Frank Masturana drives to his office. The scrap of paper on his dashboard is the outlaw line. In the next seven days, a billion dollars worth of bets, legal and illegal, will ride on these numbers. Frank Masturana likes to claim that he sets the outlaw line. That's probably not true, but he is one of the first to get it, and this inside information is valuable. Okay, seven and a half, okay, ten and a half, three and a half. By the time he reaches his office, clients from all over the country are calling in for the earliest information about next week's point spread. According to the FBI, Masturana's clients include several illegal bookies and gamblers, the kind of people who prefer to be known by code names or numbers. Sports. Sports. Come on, Hollywood Fashion Plate. How are you? Uh, stores on three. Seven. All right, 23. Well, let me know. Bookies everywhere base their porn spreads on the outlaw line. That also includes Masturana's legitimate clients. The people that subscribe to my service and talk to me are the cream of the crop in the Las Vegas area. They're the uh, managers of the legal books in town. Uh, they call me, get my opinion on the line, and then they use my line and incorporate it into theirs. Tony, the ant, Spilotro. The FBI calls him an enforcer for the Chicago family. He oversees those who set the outlaw line. This is Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano, bookie, hitman, and the most senior mafioso ever to talk. Partially disguised, he agreed to be filmed for a fee. Tony Spilatro is with the Chicago family. He probably, he's there to oversee things in Las Vegas for the Chicago family. And since he's been there, he's got all the bookmakers, all the gamblers, and he's controlled practically everything. Historically, organized crime figures have plagued Las Vegas casinos with their hidden influence. As more and more casinos open sports books, that influence will surely grow. The biggest legal sports book in the world is at the Stardust. According to FBI affidavits, the Stardust has been secretly controlled by the Mafia's Chicago family. They ran a multi-million dollar skimming operation. They installed their own front man, Alan Glick. Glick is gone, but the skim continues. Barely a year ago, the FBI took photographs as the Stardust skim money was handed over in a parking lot. FBI sources say that Al Sachs, the present owner of the Stardust, is still beholden to the Chicago family. So the place now is uh, still under the Chicago family. They just put different people in there to operate it. Now it's Al Sachs. He belongs to the Chicago family. He didn't belong to it, but he is, he is dominated by the Chicago family. 
Al Sachs Casino takes more football action than any other sports book in Las Vegas. So even in Las Vegas, where football gambling is legal, the point spread is subject to the influence, direct and indirect, of organized crime. Every Sunday, the new point spread is broadcast on the Stardust's own radio show. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Lee Pete along with Jim Brown from the beautiful Stardust Hotel. We will at attempt to amuse you for the next two hours, and in that amusement, we're going to give you some totals for next week's football games plus the line. The point spread that is put out legally in Las Vegas is picked up and published by newspapers everywhere, even newspapers like the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post. Such information supports the multi-billion dollar illegal gambling industry outside Las Vegas. With slickly packaged films cut to upbeat music, the NFL has created its own image. It is a carefully controlled image. Television has made that image part of American culture. But the NFL can do little to control the illegal football betting industry that constitutes a permanent threat to its image and its integrity. Sean McQueenie heads the FBI's Organized Crime Division. Uh, there is a connection of, uh, between organized crime and gambling in this country. The major metropolitan areas where we have our traditional families has controlled sports bookmaking for years. Charlie Parsons, FBI special agent in Las Vegas. Well, sports bookmaking in general for years has been considered the number one source of income for the mafia, the syndicate, the outfit. Twenty two billion dollars was bet on sports gambling in the United States. That was in uh, September of 1980. Up to, since that time there have been figures up to 25 billion and higher. Out of sports bookmaking, pro football is king. Uh, it's number one by far as far as the amounts of money is wagered front line followed police as they mounted an undercover operation against an illegal bookie in the Fort Lauderdale area. Here, a police cameraman stakes out an illegal payoff. You made a mistake. What do you mean you made a mistake? He says, we're only up 7,000 something. I said 7,000 something. The bookie is known to the police as Bobby Olson. He doesn't know that the two men he's talking with are undercover policemen or that this meeting is being videotaped. Police believe that Bobby Olson handles about $40,000 worth of football action a week. Even a street corner bookie like Bobby Olson will be connected to organized crime, according to this undercover officer. I would place him as a mid-level bookmaker um, in a lot, much larger organization. Part of his money he's paying either for protection from uh, organized crime, giving him the right to work in the area. He's paying tribute money to him. This is 63, go ahead. The police set out to raid Bobby Olson. Like most bookies, he'll be hard to find because he likes to keep on the move. The only way to spot him is to look for his car. And when they know where he is, the police move in fast. That's him. Bingo. In some places, police are switching their attention from gambling to narcotics. But here in South Florida, a major entry point for drugs, the importance of bookies like Bobby Olson is not lost on police. Bobby, open up. Bobby, under arrest. Ready? You have the right to remain silent. Do you understand? Anything you can't say will be used against you in a court of law. You understand? <clears throat> Gambling is the largest source of income into organized crime. A lot of people say it's narcotics, but uh, I think the general opinion is that, it, that more money filters in and is used then to purchase narcotics, and it all comes basically from football betting, which is the biggest amount of uh, 
volume business that a bookmaker will have. Quietly, right? As Bobby's clients call in, the police yeah. answer the phone and yeah. build their case against him. The guy in the corner bar betting with a bookmaker, no, that bookmaker is going to be paying some of that money back into organized crime so through funneling system. And that money is going to be used for narcotics or prostitution or any of their other illegal activities. Evidence like this can disappear in a flash. There are some special papers which allows a bookmaker um, to do this. One's called a flash paper. Anything hot really will set it afire. I have a piece here if you'd like me to demonstrate it for you. At first it burns, it burns very slow, but then it starts accelerating. And it's just a, a big ball of fire and there are actually no residue left at all. This piece of paper is water soluble paper. It's sometimes referred to as rice paper, which when immersed in water, it just rapidly dissolves dip it into it and I try to pull it out it just falls apart and you can see the ink is just kind of fading away no one keeps records when it comes to illegal football gambling but with billions of dollars bet on football each year it's easy to understand why organized crime would be interested in any inside information so the NFL warns all of its members annually to have no associations whatsoever with known gamblers. The NFL employs its own security force to make sure this does not happen. Preventing associations is the only way the NFL has of guarding against a fixed game. Behind the walls of this top security prison is a man who says he helped fix four professional games a year in 1968, 69, and 70. He says he was part of a syndicate of illegal bookies and their mafia associates. John Piazza. In return for financial assistance to his wife, Piazza repeated a story he has already told law enforcement officers. We had uh, the coach and we had the quarterback who was the offensive captain and we had the defensive captain. With help like that, the syndicate was sure to beat the point spread. Well, with the, with the quarterback, if he knew the perimeters of the scores that we wanted to, to hold, maybe he was down close to scoring a touchdown. But a touchdown would have put it out of the reach of where we wanted to go. So he'd throw a bad pass or throw it out of bounds and only kick a field goal. So that he'd have, he had control of, of where the points would fall. With well, the defensive back, if we got out of if it got out of control and maybe somebody intercepted a pass and ran it back or something that the offense has no control over, then the defensive back could slip or let somebody beat him on coverage or something, you know, enough to control where the points would fall. The coach was almost as important as the players. Well, the coach, if you've got a quarterback that's supposed to be a, a very, very good quarterback who has an extremely high percentage of completions, and then all of a sudden today he's uh, throwing them in the ground and throwing them in the seats and throwing them in a lot of different places. You don't want the crowd to start yelling at the coach and the coach to pull the player out when, when we need him to protect, to protect our investment. The purpose of this test is to determine your knowledge of and participation in payoffs for controlling the spread of points during a given professional football game. Have you voluntarily agreed to take this test? Yes. Frontline gave Piazza a lie detector test. These tests are not infallible, but this one found that he was telling the truth. He gave names, games, dates, and the actual amounts of money that changed hands. The players that were involved, they were like a, a consortium, okay? We would guarantee them $300,000. If there was three in individuals, that would be three and a hundred thousand dollars a piece. Plus, we'd give them 10 to 15 percent of what we took in. So if we took in uh, $3 million, that means that they were going to get an extra 300000 It could mount up to, uh, Pacific Instance, $800,000 was the total payoff. Piazza remembers that instance well, because he says he carried the cash to the players. The intermediary arrived in a car with uh, two football players that were on the team. And the only way that I would give the money to the intermediary was to recognize the people in the car that were the football players and for him to get in the car with them so that them and the money left together 
otherwise they might have been able to say that we didn't meet our commitment or we didn't fulfill our end of the bargain or you know whatever but i wanted to make sure that the money and them were in the same car the instance that i was involved in was not the last time that we did this and i'm sure that if they hadn't been paid for their previous activities that they wouldn't have continued on there's not a lot of group fellowship in this business Piazza's story serves to underscore the importance of the NFL's own rules on gambling. In addition to warning against accepting bribes or fixing games, the rules warn against, quote, any associating with gambling or with gambling activities. They are signed by Commissioner Pete Rosell, the man whose job it is to make sure these rules are followed by every member of the league. Does the rule about associating with gamblers cover players? and owners, managers, team members as well? Uh, it would include everyone in the NFL, but of course you have to define the term gamblers. By gamblers, I assume you're talking about illegal gambling. I'm talking about illegal gambling as Yes, well. continued associations after they know who the individuals are. Why is that so important, Mr. Commissioner? Oh, it goes to the integrity of the game. Our biggest problem is suspicion. Suspicion first clouded the NFL during the 1946 championship game. Polo grounds, pro championship game under a cloud. The Chicago Bears take the field against the grim New York Giants. Gamblers trying to make bribes involve two giant players, including halfback Kilchuk. The players had failed to report the bribes offered them. Officially, this is the only attempt to fix a game to which the NFL admits. The Bears are champs, 24 to 14, and the good name of football is still intact. In the early 1950s, the connection between mafia bosses like Frank Costello and convicted bookmakers like Frank Erickson were being exposed by the Senate Rackets Committee. What is your business? My business? I have no business. I'm in jail. Despite the occupational hazards, bookies and their mafia associates allegedly fixed a game in 1951. We had a referee in years ago that uh, uh, participated in, uh, in helping us with a game. There's a... Uh, a lot of ways, you know, that uh, there's a penalty, calls a penalty, an offside penalty. Uh, in them days, they didn't have this, uh, this television replay. You know, they could get away with a lot of stuff. Roselle's first scandal came when Alex Karras admitted betting. Now Roselle, who'd been warned about Karras, had to suspend him. Of course, you make a mistake and you have a set... Another player, Paul Horning, made the same mistake and was suspended too. But Roselle did nothing when Horning was later seen with an illegal bookie. In 1970, news broke that a grand jury was interested in four quarterbacks, two college coaches, and a bookie. A federal grand jury will begin hearing testimony in two weeks, January 20th, about the operations of perhaps the largest betting gambling operation in sports history. The key man in the entire investigation is Don Dawson. It would appear he knows everybody who is anybody in sports. As a college coach 10 years ago, Frank Cush often phoned gambler Don Dawson. But last year, Roselle let Cush become an NFL coach. We told the Baltimore Colts we saw no reason why uh, he would not uh, be accepted as a coach at the time they hired him. An IRS affidavit, an investigation showed that...